Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights here with Rich Klein, 1998 Pacific Football Products. Mike Kramer sent Rich some spreadsheets. I grouped them into sport and year. The ones we have are very informative of that point in time, what was going on with Pacific. I think we can extrapolate to what must have been happening with Donruss Playoff and Upper Deck Top, certainly. Fleer, Skybox, different ownership structures in those days. But Pacific was owned by Mike Kramer. He was the owner, founder, and probably the creative guy, too. He, well, he was a good he photographer. He did photography. Yeah, he was a big sports fan. He had a fabulous collection. Actually, he has collections, not just uh, sports cards. He's got a lot of stuff. Well, my, and Mike has finished all his cancer treatments, thankfully. And he's become quite the artist as he's gotten younger. He's multi-talented. Gosh. You know, just, and he's not, we'll call it, book learned. He doesn't have a lot of degrees, but he, when he sets his mind to something, get out of his way. He basically willed himself... He persevered into a license. Football first, I think. So we're going to talk about football from 98. Football was his first. In 90? 91 was his first. 91, okay, yeah. It was another thing where I think he rushed through it a little bit because there are mistakes in 91 football, some of which are typo-oriented, not superstar-oriented. This is how they weren't deliberate. Like Bubba Paris is spelled P-A-R-I-S instead of Paris, like Paris France. But that's the type of mistake you make when you're rushing through it. You're not taking as much time. And again, they got much better with that as the years went on. Yeah. Uh, hats off. We've got three card company uh, sponsors of this show, Top Spinning and Upper Deck. It's a challenge. These sets, they just don't happen overnight. It's a lot of people behind the scenes making sure everything's right. Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, their auction catalogs. It's not that they're works of art, but they've got to stand behind what they put there. They can't over-describe something or they can under-describe it, but if they've got to be accurate in what they say and they've got to stand behind it. Here, the Burbank Sports Cards and Mike Stadium Sports Cards, local card shop, which is what you get, except with Rob Veris doing so much on eBay and Beckett Marketplace and other places. He's got to make sure his data is correct. And of course, ComC and uh, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, they're, they're data companies you know, in their price guides and their sales. They've got to have, uh, not algorithms, but they, they've got to make sure their systems are tight. You know what I'm thinking about as you're mentioning the card companies? We've talked to card companies, and our friends from Panini says it's 11 to 12 to 13 months between the beginning of a product and the time we see it on the shelves. Jason from Upper Deck, their president, Mashara, Mashara, yeah. Yeah. has mentioned that it's up to 14 months for them. I don't think these products were taking 14 months in these days between the time they were being thought about and then the time they hit the shelves. I think the the whole gestation life was a little bit shorter than that in these days for Pacific, possibly because they crossed all the sports they had, baseball, football, and hockey. Their brands are pretty much the same. In other words, they made it a point to have brand continuity. It's not a cookie cutter, but there there are some forms. There's some structure to those things that allow you to make continued use out of something. That worked last year. We're going to use these kinds of insert ratios or these kind of design considerations and all that. Yeah. Uh, let me just say, from doing the magazines and, and the publishing and the creative effort there, the start to finish can be 14 months. But it's a lot of stuff happens after the seventh inning. So there's a lot of preparation, getting the design forms and all that stuff lined up the first few months. There's no real rush there, but you're doing it. You're getting all these artists lined up and other things. But those last few months are very intense. And most people think that's all there is. It's what I've called precrastination. It looks like you're waiting the last minute, but you've done all this preparatory work that it, nobody really knows about. And so that's what Jason and Upper Deck and, and uh, Panini, the whole process does take a year. We're talking about precrastination. Remember, in these days, this is just before the jersey and autograph card boom. So seemingly add a bunch to, uh, more to it of production and, and making sure you got the right jersey. Oh, my goodness. I saw the Panini room or whatever it was of, of all the unused, to be used uh, jersey. It was fascinating and scary at the same time. I'm sure. In fact, I've got in my cabinet there, I've got the, the scraps from a Randy Moss jersey of the jersey that they didn't, they, they cut out the meaningful parts and then the scraps. I won't say they gave me the scraps, but it was an honor that they gave me this little That's a really ball. Cool. So I that, never knew you had that. That's yeah. a really cool collectible. Yeah. Yeah. You can show it to me a little bit yeah, later. Yeah, I will show it to you, Rich. It's, but, uh, it's, but what's interesting is we're talking about 98, the year of Moss Aiden, and Manning. Yeah. Manning's drafted number one. Number two was Ryan Leaf, and for a time they were 1A and 1B until Manning became a cultural icon, and Ryan Maybe Leaf had self-destructed. Self-destructed. 
And Randy Moss was drafted number 21. He got passed over by a bunch of teams because of perceived personal issues. Well, he was a prima donna. He was a prima donna. Well, some of it, he's a kid. And name 21 me, or 22. Yeah. yeah, name me any 21-year-old kid that doesn't have some sort of prima donna issues. Is it a prima donna if, you're, if you've are if you dominated every league you've ever played in? No, he was so if good. If you're six foot four and every ball that goes up in the air, you win, which is almost what happened with him. He was a savant. Well, when 19, the ball went up in the air, he got it. And, you know, and he got even hotter after the Thanksgiving game down here in Dallas in 1998. He catches three passes, by the way, only three, all for more than 50 yards. All for touchdowns. I think he beat Deion Sanders on two or three of those. That game was a Pat Summerall, John Madden announced yeah. game on Fox. And well, take that, Cowboys. It's basically, that was the criticism of Randy Moss, is that he could turn it on when he wanted to. And so why aren't you doing that every week? That's the curse of, I think, greatness. It is he the curse really of was great. He was great. He's a first out Hall of Famer, and rightly so. You can't be much better than that. Yeah. 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 And 10 years later, when most receivers are on the downside at the age of 30 or 31, he goes to New England and transforms that team into almost going undefeated for 19 games until they play the Giants, led by Peyton Manning's younger brother, Eli, in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Thank goodness for the Mannings on that. Well, um, in football, as soon as you get one guy that you have to have two guys to cover him, it means a mismatch for the rest. And so... You know, it's... But Manning and Moss were so hot in 1998, it really goosed up the market. I mean, I was yes. working on the football magazine as an analyst occasionally at the time. It was fun looking at the... So, so you're saying that we're doing the year of 98 Pacific football yeah. and we'll break out the products. But are you saying that's the second year of, in that era behind the year 2000 with Tom Brady where products... You'd be excited to open. I think it's mainly because of Peyton. But Brady doesn't hit until 2001. You're not excited. No, 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 no. But I'm talking about now. If oh, somebody, now, yeah. If somebody said, hey, I've got a box of 2000 football. Are you interested in it? You'd probably say yes, unless it's been stripped. 98 football, not as much as that. But still, you think there can be some Peyton Manning rookie cards in there. Well, you'd have to think about that because they're not active anymore. The Manning brothers are doing that thing on ESPN. Yeah, and Moss, they're going to be more and more popular. And they are and getting Moss more. Is, I think yeah, Randy's doing some announcing. He's too, done right? some announcing, or, so or color or whatever. You yeah, so you don't realize it, but those are fun to open. If you hit the Manning, you say thank you. You hit well, the Moss, you say thank you. I think they both have autograph cards in some of the products too. That's like yeah. a double win. Okay, we got six Pacific football products. Pacific, the flag, twelve million cards produced. That's not that many. Aurora, eight million cards produced. That includes inserts, parallels, and base cards. Crown Royale. 1.6 million, Omega, 10 million. I see a lot of those. Paramount, 9 million. I see a lot of those. And then Revolution, only 1.5 million. So Crown Royale and Revolution across brands are yeah. tougher, especially I felt like uh, Crown Royale was with well, Crown every, card being, is a boutique, every card being die cut. It's a, it's a boutique brand. It's shorter. And we saw the same thing in 99 Baseball, that there aren't that many of them total out there. And by the way, your products totaled just slightly over 42 million total cards. <laughs> That, which is uh, less than baseball. Which is less than baseball, which makes sense in those days. Nobody knew how hot Ma Manning and Moss were going to be in 98, at least at the beginning of the year. And, but you got 42 million cards. I bet you Topps made 42 million cards of just their base brand in 98. More, if not, more. <laughs> more. Okay, Aurora football, the only enigma there to me, it's a basic set, but they have the cubes, those, the little cube cards. I can't they take don't even those cards. I can't take those. And I, I don't know what to do with them. I, I don't want to step on them. Were they in a rectangular box? I just, I, I don't know whether they had to be folded up and turned into a box or they were in the box you as know, a box. If I was still doing my synagogue show the I'll way I was doing them, where they would end up going? In the Island of the Misfit, Misfit Toys. Toys. Because they have shape. I think cards, we're griping about whether cards should be standard size or not. Can they be only two dimensional or can they not be? Can they just be flat? <laughs> but, but it depends what type of three dimensional. Kellogg's cards were, were, were three dimensional, so to speak. They're just fine. They're lenticular. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm talking about you can't stack them up very easily. Crown Royale football, just a smaller set. Uh, and you can see every one of these spreadsheets that Mike Kramer provided for us has a column called extra, which are the extra sets that were held back for uh, customer complaints or whatever. Well, uh, and some went to the media, I think. But and when you get uh, a card out of but a it's pack, six or seven percent a lot of times. When time, you get so a card like, out of a pack and it's got a, a crease, or you know, because they do travel, cards can get tra damaged in travel. Yeah. You, you, no matter how well they're packed, they can get damaged in travel. 
copier. I, I think they have to do that, but what, what they're doing is they're not printing up. They can't go back to press and print one card. What it looks like to me from the numbers here, it's validate Pacific is printing a sheet of all the inserts or most of the inserts. So there'll be a sheet of all the inserts and not commingled with the sheets of the base card. So they're base card sheets, insert sheets, and so they're going to print up another 100 sets. I have not seen, they probably got remaindered, but I don't think I've seen them. If they, I haven't seen a remainder of a bunch of sets. I've seen cards sprinkled more than I would think a dollar box, but I haven't seen somebody with quantity of Pacific product. And that's another testament because yeah. I will tell you that when you and it's I, the integrity of the brand. when you and I used to go out to Pacific, we never went out together, but we both went out to Seattle. And Mike Kramer, I will tell you, thinking about that, that his brother, when he was working with him too, they were very cognizant of some of the remainder some of these card companies had in those days. And they were very cognizant of not doing that and right. making sure. In fact, Mike Kramer built his, not fortune, but he was party to some of the top's remainders, like Steve Myland, because he was in that area. He got a lot of remainder stuff from, from the top's distributors at the end of the year, because he would take it all. He would take it all. I don't know how many warehouses he had. But, if you but, take it all, people are happy to sell it to you. They're going to sell it to you. The other thing that's interesting here, and we can't go into every one of these, but uh, there are specific brands that are hobby only. They're dominant retail brands, and uh, most of them fall in the middle, where there's some hobby, there's some retail. And that's what actually the, the licensors want. The hobby wants stuff only for the hobby, but the licensors wants to make sure well, that's how you that, grow the market. that the stuff ends up in the big box retail, exactly. because not every area has a hobby store. For some people, the hobby store is Walmart. Finally, on the last page here with the Revolution cards, which again, three card pack as they were in baseball the next year and the shadow cards and all that stuff. The extra sets that they produce, there's actually a decrement. There's minus 12 or minus 10 or minus 24. And we're speculating that when they printed out these 500 extra sets and then take away 12, those 12 went to Krause, Tough Stuff, Beckett, uh, other publications. Maybe and, he had to send one to the leagues too. And probably to the league officials and stuff like that. Good point. Uh, because all the way down the line, they were sending a copy of the inserts, the sets. Just re remembering in the early days, football especially, in the Led Denny days, they would send you a binder that had been meticulously with these cheap cards put in the binder. Now would be worth more in the sheets would be worth more in the cards. But you could go through them. And that was very kind of them to do that. And it allowed us to be able to... Uh, go immediately to the card and, and be able to show it. That's in somebody who understands public and, relations. And they understand PR. Denny understood PR and how to beat the drum loudly. Yeah. So I think the, the minus 24 for the showstoppers, that doesn't mean 24 sets came to Rich and me. I think one set came one to you. One set may have come to the company and, and we were able to show it and once went there. And I don't know where the others went, but again, it's not enough to move the needle. We needed to be able to show what the cards look like. And, and the card companies wanted us to do that. Now, if we would have just taken the cards and put them in a box. But I think we look for opportunities to demonstrate either through set reviews or using them in articles. I think almost every Pacific set is underrated if you think about it, especially these brands. You've told the story about buying strip panini packs at, oh, at a no. sale, which were terrible and great at the same time. I, I almost turned around and walked out because every pack had been opened. You had to buy the box. You couldn't buy packs. You weren't allowed to search the packs. But finally, when the guy wasn't looking, I just looked at one of the packs, I thought, and I found there was an insert in there. Now I realize the insert's not so good, but then I'd see a serial number of apparel. I wouldn't see anything thick. So there's no autographs, no game used, but there was some okay stuff there. And it was a half price box. If somebody said, hey, I'm going to buy this box and I'm going to take one card out of every pack, and I'm going to sell you what's left for half. I don't think I'd want to do that. No. Nowadays, when there's big hits in the packs. But that's, in effect, what I did. But the value was distributed enough in those days that I guess I did okay. And that was in an estate sale. I'm thinking, who has an estate sale where they have opened packs with one card removed? other than a former dealer. Even then, why wouldn't they? So anyway, thanks, Mike Kramer. I think there's a lot to be learned about current days and future days from the past. Thank you, Rich, for your great commentary. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.